We want people still to go on about their lives. We want people uh, to rest assured that a lot is being done to protect them. That last clip was from March 13th, just about two weeks ago. In retrospect, is that message, at least in part, to blame for how rapidly the virus has spread across the city? Now, Jake, we should not be focusing, in my view, on anything looking back on any level of government right now. This is just about how we save lives going forward. That was New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio on CNN's State of the Union Sunday, swatting away his own words uh, as uh, presented to him by Jake Tapper. Hello, creepy shut-ins, and welcome to the Reason Roundtable. I'm Matt Welch, joined by my video-streamed colleagues, Peter Suderman, Nick Gillespie, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Uh, hi. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy third week of the pandemic. Uh, pandemic has lasted longer than that, so I hate to That's fair. check you right out of the gate, although maybe it wasn't uh, declared as such by the always correct World Health Organization. Um, I uh, should say at the top to listeners and viewers alike, um, please bear with our metaphorical sawdust and duct tape and rubber bands and such. Uh, including to but not uh, including but not limited to the sounds of uh, five year olds throwing tantrums around my shoulders and also uh, Matt I'm I'm not five Matt. come on <laughs> and I was going to say uh, also please do not judge harshly any visual information uh, that you might see uh, unless it's uh, Gillespie's mustache but he shaved it uh, for mm -hmm. this yep. very uh, podcast which I uh, really appreciate that's uh, I did that to help uh, bring the nation together Matt. Uh, it worked. As, yeah. Yes. Uh, as did uh, Catherine's eyeliner. Okay, let's uh, start <laughs> with a quick every Monday uh, grim body count on coronavirus. We're up to 35,000 deaths worldwide, uh, including 2,500 in the United States, 1,000 of which are in New York, most of which are in New York City. Uh, confirmed infections are at three quarters of a million worldwide, 145,000 in the U.S., 60,000 in New York. We keep mentioning Gotham because uh, Nick and I are here at the epicenter or near the epicenter, which I think is in Queens. Um, a hospital capacity is being stretched right here, right now. It will happen um, sooner rather than later in some other cities in America as well. There are um, uh, rapidly expanded capacities in places like the Javits Center, the Conference Center. Central Park has tent city hospitals being erected right now. The White House over the weekend issued, after some kerfuffleage and whatnot, um, a uh, travel advisory for people leaving and coming to and fro the uh, tri-state area. Trump uh, administration also extended the uh, general social distancing advisory guidance for the country to April 30th. Um, and also various officials, including the president, have been sort of rhetorically preparing America to be ready for between 100,000 and 200,000 uh, virus related deaths. And oh, yeah, Congress last week passed uh, 2.3 trillion dollar uh, sort of stimulus bailout rescue uh, mission thingy. So um, there's been a bunch of journalism, including at Reason, about uh, actions that governments and others have taken so far, leading us to this point, um, including uh, actions that have not been particularly helpful and useful. So Catherine, as the editrix of the uh, operation, uh, maybe kick us off here on a round of government failures or inadequacies that have gotten us to this point and hopefully maybe some uh, some workarounds that we have learned in the process of getting out of said failures. Yeah, I mean, I think we should go back to the clip from the top of the show, which, of course, was uh, the most perfect distillation of this attitude that we're getting, which is uh, government is well-intentioned and everyone was doing the best they could do with the information they had. And anyway, let's not dwell on the past, but instead look forward to the bright future where government continues to be well-intentioned and do the best it can do. Meanwhile, government at every level has failed quite spectacularly in handling this. Now, everyone has failed. I personally am failing right now at handling <laughs> this. Just to be clear, we are all failing together as a nation, as individuals. But I do think, um, you know, all of us have seen a lot and taken a lot of guff from this. There are no libertarians in a pandemic line. Um, first of all, 
absurd and insulting. It's not as if libertarians unique among political philosophies didn't think, hey, what if there's a public health crisis? We did. Um, but uh, the thing I want to talk about in particular is the messaging about mask wearing and mask purchasing, because I think this is a great example of um, the kind of government noble lie at its worst. I don't know yet what the new guidance will be. There's been rumors and counter rumors that the guidance is going to change and we should all be wearing masks 10 days from now. And in fact, maybe we all should have been wearing masks all along. Certainly other nations have taken that route, uh, potentially to some success. Uh, at the same time, uh, healthcare workers need them more. Uh, so, in fact, no one needs masks. Don't listen. No one needs a mask. Um, this kind of messaging is why people don't trust the government or why they shouldn't. Um, you know, I am a libertarian. I don't trust the government. And I still was like, yeah, they're probably right. I don't need a mask. And now I'm on Amazon trying to figure out how to buy masks. This is not a failure of libertarianism. This is not a failure of uh, of the private markets. It's It's a failure of government. And in fact, if anybody gets us out of this, it is largely going to be all of the people who tried to figure out a way to make a buck on making and selling different types of masks. Uh, I bought some on Amazon. We'll see if they come. That's a mistake, uh, Catherine. Um, I mean, yes, buy them on Amazon and we did too. But you of all people should know that the place to go is Etsy um, for masks. No, I do not oh. want some hippie. Ma like that person <laughs> probably like coughed on the beautiful hippie mask right before they shipped it to me. I like, no, but they have like a artisanal disease. You know, they have like uh, true. tuberculosis from they have the like, strain that killed John Keats or something like that. You know what it's I true. learned about it real quick might detour. protect Viruses. you from COVID-19, but it'll have yeah. a bird on it. That's true. Put you know, a bird on I, it. I do think that part of, you know, what what we're talking about here, and it is interesting because like I, I'm willing to say, you know, there's there's no question that the government has failed and, and that the two major institutions of the government that are specifically designed to keep us from being in this situation, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the FDA have royally fucked up and they continue to with almost daily new uh, you know, directives to get in the way of stuff. But I think the bigger problem here is actually that the model and this this is on a uh, I think on a, on a deeper or higher level than we're normally used to thinking about this. This is more of a Hayekian knowledge problem where it's like various people within the government had good ideas or partial information and they were kind of trying to push through their understanding and their their presumptions about what was best. Um, and it turns out that like nobody had a single best answer for what to do. And that part of the problem here is less like that the government knew had bad information and made a wrong decision. And it's more that like you need a lot of different kind of ideas bubbling up in a marketplace of ideas during a pandemic as much as anything else. And that we would have had more information if if local state and local health agencies had had more discretion to test and to do stuff on their own without having to run it all the way up to the federal government and get and get denied we would have been able to choke off certain parts of the infection earlier. Uh, when you look at countries like uh, Germany, there's a piece in the New York Times, which has gone, you know, back and forth from, you know, the New York Times is, you know, as they report, what they report changes. But Germany doesn't have the same kind of top down health authority that dictates everything for everybody. And instead, they, you know, they issue advisories and different departments or state level groups then make decisions like what we really need here is decentralized decision making, uh, because a lot of private actors have really bad information or bad ideas and a lot of public ones do. And so, uh, you know, that to me is part of the takeaway here is that even in this kind of situation, what we need is more discussion rather than less discussion. Uh, uh, John Stossel has a pretty good video about uh, Germany and, and other things that I recommend that he did from his, uh, you know, his remote location uh, apartment. Uh, Suderman, build on that a little bit. What uh, what um, missteps have you seen uh, taken by the government so far that have contributed to where we are today? It starts with the CDC botching the testing rollout process. And then really, I think the bigger failure in, in many ways was with the FDA. So the way this process normally works is that the CDC develops the test kit. And that's kind of the standard, right? It's not so much the test itself, although it is a test. It is the test that then private companies could be licensed to produce on mass. And so the way this works is the government develops the the set of sort of here's what we expect from a test. So at the at the time that the CDC was doing this, there were a bunch of state labs and a bunch of private companies that were also developing their own tests. 
they went to the FDA and said, hey, can we use these? And this was in the middle of February. Uh, they were asking at least as early as February 18th and saying, we've got tests that work. Meanwhile, the CDC's test, in addition to just being slow generally, they botched the initial test and actually had to recall the test. Uh, and so they had to basically start over. Um, and so what the CDC did was create a choke point. And then what the FDA did was say that none of these alternatives would be allowed to be used. And they didn't approve other tests until the end of February, um, despite the fact that the former head of the FDA, Scott Gottlieb, was tweeting in the first week of February that companies like Roche have platforms for this stuff. They're well suited. They are built to roll out testing um, in, in for, uh, you know, in a, in a large scale. And that didn't happen. And that didn't happen because the CDC was a choke point and because the FDA decided to ensure that the CDC would be a choke point. And because of that, we had very little visibility on uh, the actual numbers for people who were infected uh, in the United States until really this just this last week. And that has just absolutely hamstrung our response. It has been uh, it, because we have been operating blind. Governors, uh, the federal government haven't known what to do. And it has been a huge, huge problem. That is the original sin in our uh, fail, in our, our sort of major failures to respond here is that we blew the testing process. And when I say we blew it, I mean the CDC and the FDA worked together to ensure that private companies that are really, really good at this sort of thing couldn't do their jobs and couldn't make life better for millions of Americans. Can I just say I am very uncomfortable with the number of times the word choke has been said already in this podcast. If we could, if we could just scale that back as a disease metaphor. We want to choke the like off, no, life off. No, okay, made it worse. From Sorry, that. I uh, am going to uh, take my choke pointers no. privilege. Uh, uh, no, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the person that we heard from at the top of the uh, of the old pod, uh, uh, Bill de Blasio, mayor of New York. Um, thankfully, there has been I'm sure everyone has seen by now various uh, mostly Democratic, but also the bulwark <laughs> um, kind of uh, super clips of Donald Trump saying various things, uh, kind of minimizing the crisis. And while well, the curve goes up like this and uh, and more and more uh, deaths and cases and such like, well, they're finally starting to do that now with Bill de Blasio. Um, similar kind of uh, uh, super clips, even from comments that he made uh, as, as recently as this month. Um, I'm ultimately not going to talk about all of that and, and focus micro microscopically on the schools. But I just want to point out, because this is amazing, um, that on February 10th, this is what the mayor of New York City, which is now the epicenter of the coronavirus in the United States, said, if you're under 50 and you're healthy, which is most New Yorkers, there's very little threat here. The disease, even if you were to get it, basically acts like a common cold or flu and transmission is not that easy. Thanks. Thanks, Bill de Blasio. Um, so he's wrong about transmission, but he's not wrong about the effects of the disease. I mean, I, I want to throw in the idea that we're, we are overreacting still. But like um, to say know, partly, that we are overreacting is yeah. not the same to say as um, it's basically the flu and transmission is not easy. Right. That that yeah. is there's no, no. there's, fair, no, there's fair, nothing yeah. to support that. Well, uh, that point. But yeah. that's. I just wanted to throw that as a as the palette, uh, a moose bouche, uh, but talk more specifically. Well, shouldn't about... it be the thing that puts a big dollop of phlegm in your throat rather Thank than you. clears the mouth? Are you I'm choking gonna, gonna on Matt's so that a moose bouche? There's yeah. so no. Yeah. Um, uh, no. The uh, it was clear uh, from uh, this uh, parent of New York City. Uh, school kids, public school kids, that uh, the mayor and the Department of Education uh, chair here, Richard Carranza, were ideologically predisposed to not close the schools. So there's plenty of arguments. Should you should you not close schools? Um, uh, I happen to believe one thing about that, but let's set that aside. They were so um, uh, predisposed towards that that they would come up with different reasons for it. And as part of the process, um, uh, New York Post has done some great reporting on this. They intentionally they sent directives to schools and to teachers to not report, to not report to the Department of Health when they had a positive test. Um, there was a teacher at a school pregnant, by the way, um, who tested positive, I believe it was like on March 15th or 14th and said, hey, look, 
I'm positive. I've been at school all week. Maybe we should shut down the school. They're like, no, not only are we not shutting down, but everyone, all the teachers have to come for a mandatory, like extra training here. And since then, uh, half a dozen of those teachers have fallen uh, 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 sick as well. They have suppressed information. Um, this is the, the problem. You can have uh, differences of opinion about various things, but when your ideology not only points you in a direction, but also uh, it impels you or uh, you know encourages you to suppress information from people, um, that's when you have uh, all kinds of uh, danger that comes up. Um, what out there uh, have you seen? I mean, there's a there's a meme going around uh, in the world and we're all kind of leaning into it, even by the framing at, up the top here, a meme saying, oh, this crisis has confirmed that Proves all, my priors. Yep. all of my pre-existing beliefs are true. So let's uh, let's let's shake that up a little bit. And Catherine, since you're so enthusiastic about uh, that uh, particular mean, is there anything about this crisis and the response and whatever um, that has caused you to explore perhaps the limitations of your ideological priors? Uh, I'm about to give you like a really cop out answer, but yes. here it comes anyway. Um, so. Yeah, like I'm thinking a lot about this, like, behold, how the crisis confirms everything I already believed. Um, you guys are not getting probably quite as many submissions from outside writers who all would like to run in reason their essay about how coronavirus proves their priors. Uh, like I'm seeing just a huge uptick in um, in that genre in my inbox alone, much less in the world. I will say uh, and this this hurts me. So it is at least somewhat of a of a real answer to this question. Um, this does not make me change my underlying anarchist views. It does make me more sympathetic to the ways that anarchists annoy the bejesus out of minarchists because we are muddling your messaging. Which it's is to say. Wrong. A really lot of wrong. the a lot of the libertarian responses to the there are no libertarians in a pandemic critique have been, hey, the thing libertarians think the state should do is respond to airborne infectious disease. Like that's the one freaking thing the state can do. Uh, but of course, me out here being an anarchist, I'm like, um, actually, um, <laughs> I stand I stand by my actually, because as we discussed at the top of the show, the state is doing a terrible job at that. It does a bad job at all the things we should have no state. However, I am sorry to my fellow libertarians for the fact that the existence of me and moreover, the existence of louder, more annoying variants of me are complicating your messaging. Um, just to be clear, as always, my anarchism is uh, the most gradualist form. And so I would say, yeah, once we get rid of all the other things the government does, we can talk about getting rid of th the part where we try to control airborne infectious disease from some kind of centrally managed uh, power. But again, just want to note, it's going badly. Uh, is that state capacity anarchism, Catherine? Shut <laughs> your That's mouth. That's a great idea. Matt Welsh. That's a very good Just idea. zip it. Uh, Suderman, talk about how Catherine's the problem. Oh, she's the greatest uh, boss and editor ever. Oh, um, so much. Uh, no, it's because you can- uh, And I, I say this like with like two other bosses you. and editors yeah, I was gonna on, say this, ah, good on this. Good point. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, look, she's my current boss and editor. So um, so she she gets the title. <laughs> By definition, that's is like the calling best. someone yeah. your current wife. Ouch. Yeah. Um, uh, hopefully my uh, my boss and editor for a long time here. Um, the <laughs> so I will I will say uh, for the rest of your life, really, I will <laughs> Go say ahead. Just, let's get out of this zone. Keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is this has confirmed my <laughs> priors in some ways. Uh, you know, I wrote uh, that you should play video games. I believed that beforehand. Um <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but it also, I, it has, it has uh, caused me to think more, um, and uh, about, and perhaps a little differently about stimulus and econ and fiscal policy, um, than uh, than I did before. And so, and even going into this, even you, there's a video in which I interviewed uh, Veronique de Rougy, um, uh, right at the, as this was sort of rolling out, when, in which we talked about the insufficiency of economic policy responses. Um, but when the government shuts down the economy and prevents people from working, when it is a 
when it is a government driven recession, and I assume that that's what we're in, I guess technically we haven't had the committee that calls this thing or calls things a recession, call this a recession, but we're in a recession right now. And we are in a recession because the government demanded that people close their businesses and stop going to work and stop interacting with the economy. And in that case, I find it harder to make the case broadly against any sort of large scale fiscal response that attempts to pay people back or sort of to cover for the the days and weeks and months in which people either can't work or are very limited in what they can do because the government has said your business is closed. You cannot get revenue the way that you planned. You cannot go to work. And that's not a ringing endorsement or anything close to the particular stimulus package that we passed. Um, I suspect that if nothing else, it will be implemented badly and there will be minimal uh, insufficient oversight of it. I mean, the, the oversight issue, you know, we're, we're going to is just going to be a, a mess as they spend all of this money um, and figure out who they're going to give it to, especially on the corporate side. At the same time, when the government says you can't you can't work. And that's the reason you can't work. That's the only reason. It's not because you were bad at your job. It's not because there is a market failure. It's not because uh, there was sort of an, an underlying condition in the economy. It's because the government said you're out of work. Then a large fiscal response. I can see a case for it in a way that I maybe couldn't have a month or two months ago. Uh, Nick, do you want to confess uh, how much of a libertarian you no longer are um, based on the <laughs> coronavirus? Uh, you know, I think I had uh, gone through most of my uh, death and dying stages years ago. So for me, uh, the one thing that this drives home more than anything, uh, you know, I've been working. I started working remotely from reason in 1996. And uh, my day to day life is not substantially different than it has been for, you know, since then uh, for what's that, 23 years, 24 years uh, around that time. And I think what I'm actually um, kind of rethinking now, it's less about government policy and it's more about uh, in the mid 90s. I was very much of a proselytizer for moving online and kind of escaping, not not escaping, but building a world in the cloud or it wasn't called the cloud then, but cyberspace and whatnot. And that- On the information um, superhighway. Yeah, you know, it's funny because nobody used that term, but cyberspace I, was definitely Then you guys missed an opportunity because information superhighway is an incredible- Well, you always, you always want to paint the future in terms from like the previous industrial era. So, you know, we should have been calling it the Celestial Railroad or something. Uh, but it, <laughs> it's- you know, it's um, we've we've been accomplishing that kind of vision of a migration into a more distributed, decentralized, uh, you know, both online as well as meat space reality and whatnot. And I think what we're looking at now is, you know, it's a forced migration into a lot of that. And I think uh, the, there will be really good and interesting, meaningful shifts that, you know, in, in a piece that I wrote, uh, I likened it to, you know, cyberspace was kind of like that big uh, home exercise piece of equipment that you bought and now you use to put dirty clothes on, never got around to using. We're doing that more. And in things like education in particular and medicine, we're finally seeing people getting their asses in gear to actually start doing stuff in a mix of online as well as, uh, you know, kind of in, in what will eventually come back to being real uh, space and things like that, but that it's actually, it's, it, we haven't theorized, um, you know, a kind of a post, you know, 20th century world very well. Um, and I think this will hopefully, you know, what, what will come out of this is, is a better mix of really using all of the online stuff as well as kind of really sharpening the, uh, uh, you know, the case for meat space. It's weird when you go outside, even in places like New York, you know, Matt, where you and I are, you know, most of the restaurants are kind of shitty and mediocre. They haven't really, um, they didn't really build up the physical space because they didn't have to yet. And so I, I'm not sure that this gets at, at, at your main question, but what I'm looking forward to coming out of this is a richer appreciation both for what cyberspace or, you know, cloud, whatever you want to call it, needs to be doing to really have people inhabit there, but also you know, the rest of our lives so that you're not going to mediocre restaurants anymore. And whole cities are like that. I spent a good chunk of the past 20 years living outside of Cincinnati 
It's a good example of a mid-sized city. You know, it's not smaller than New Orleans or, uh, you know, or, or someplace like Savannah or, or um, uh, uh, you know, other cities um, and, uh, you know, that have a real sense of place. But it never really developed it very much. And I think, you know, that's something that I'm looking forward to seeing uh, take off, you know, post pandemic. I should, uh, first of all, not scratch my face, but uh, second of all, uh, scratch your face as say, much as you want. Man. Thank you. Um, so it's still uh, a free country. Say that uh, one thing that this is underlined, maybe in the in an opposite direction from Nick, is uh, I live in a very you know walkable restaurant community filled uh, uh, neighborhood, and um, the thing that keeps me sane in during this uh, long cabin fever. Uh, shining reenactments that we're all going through uh, is taking a walk through the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, it, it it makes my heart go pangity pang um, to see how many places are closed. And uh, and it sort of makes me makes me realize anew how much uh, the thing that makes me happy is to see bustle. Um, and to see uh, humans interacting and to be part of it and to sit out my front patio and wave and call the neighbors over to have a drink and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and uh, That's make- all good. I'm, what I'm talking about is like, why are you having calling the neighbors over rather than going to a corner bar that is fully inhabiting what a corner bar should be, as opposed to just being like uh, half assing it? That's Can like, I say too much of that. I'm having the opposite experience, uh, which is I have always been team Matt on this front that like the best la- and most beautiful landscape is like an urban street where all the shops are open and some people are eating food like that's that's my optimal environment. However, this has forced me to do nature. I have been doing uh, some nature. <laughs> could you do that and... thing with your eyes again that you just did right before the word I... nature? Was... I can't, I'm not sure. It was so spontaneous. I can't recreate it because that's how I feel about nature. I don't really like the outdoors very much, but um, my children are antsy and we have Rock Creek Park here in Washington, D.C., which is beautiful. And so I found myself genuinely recreationally putting my hands on dirty rocks <laughs> like and kind of enjoying it. And I was like, oh, I see. Interesting. So, you know, there is a flip side, which is like when the optimal bustling commercial street is not available, you know, nature's all right, I guess. Nature is the ultimate product of the Industrial Revolution. Rock Creek Park certainly yeah. is. Like yeah, the no, idea I mean, of the like, let's carve a chunk out totally of the middle a of a city yeah. to do the nature in. Um, and to is, so that the grubby working class people can commune with nature and be less bestial and criminal cr- crime prone. It's working uh, right now. Uh, Suderman talked about the uh, stimulus and uh, and his own uh, weird uh, fondness for it. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, it, uh, you've already, Peter, talked about your own kind of confessionals. But... I'm, I'm very excited, Matt, that the Kennedy Center in uh, you know got twenty five million dollars and immediately started laying off people in the stimulus, which goes to the large point. And Peter, I think you will. Uh, your point is taken that when the government shuts everything down, you know they have a certain re- level of responsibility. But this bill is going to be the biggest landmark in the number of companies. And Justin Amash was tweeting about how United Airlines got freaking bailed out and immediately sent out letters like firing people. Well, the no, even Center better did that. The, the, and the it's airlines, like it, the airline. Uh, we, they got their money on the condition yes, that they wouldn't that they fire would anybody fire until sep- I believe it's September yeah. 30th. And they right. sent out notices uh, then saying wait. that everybody was furloughed or fired on October 1st. It's the <laughs> perfect. It's the one time that they can really guarantee on time delivery. Right. Um, this the the stimulus is a bad or whatever we're calling it is a bad bill by design and conception. And it will lead to, you know, if not ruin, it is going to be as bad as the bailout after the financial collapse. And it's going to be as bad as all the money that was poured into a bunch of stuff that we can't even identify anymore after 9-11. Um, 
there is no question, I think, from a libertarian perspective, you know, what do you do when you are faced with this kind of like system wide problem? What what is the role of the government in maintaining, if not the economy, because who who cares on some level about, you know, this indicator or that indicator of the stock market? And it's more how do you guarantee, you know, a minimal level of mass health and, you know, suitability for continuing to live and all of that kind of stuff. But there's no question that this bill is not designed to deliver that. And it won't. That'll come by because of private sector activity and things like that. But this is a nightmare. Um, and it's only get, it's going to take us decades to understand the full contours of that nightmare. Uh, Suderman, uh, you are, are the resident uh, process uh, geek on this podcast. Talk about the process of this bill and what that says about the way that Congress has been devolving over the years. The process here was, welp, we closed down the economy, better spend a lot of money real fast. And then they kind of came up with some ways to do that. And uh, because they were trying to do it real fast, Democratic staffers who were writing the actual legislative text in particular just dropped in a whole bunch of junk, a bunch of Democratic priorities um, and tried to sneak those in because when you're trying to spend money really fast, there isn't time to actually go through and read the bill and read the bill text. And in fact, this had already happened uh, just a couple of weeks prior where we had this relatively small, only eight billion dollar uh, kind of uh, initial recovery package. Um, and they had to go through and do a, a a bunch of corrections on it in the days after it initially passed because Republicans voted for the thing and then found out that Democrats had stuck a bunch of junk into the bill that they wanted to remove. And then it would there was an issue there because Democrats were like, well, we don't obviously want to take that out. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of really grubby partisan politics as usual going into this. And you combine it with the fact that it's it's in fact very difficult to write good legislation, even in the best of times, even when you're not trying to spend two trillion dollars, two plus trillion dollars uh, on an emergency basis. Um, and so what we ended up with was a kind of a, a grab bag of money for middle class earners, money for corporations, um, uh, expanded unemployment benefits that in some ways, look, if you want to talk about we should probably talk about this provision specifically because um, it, I think it hasn't gotten enough attention amongst sort of libertarian types who have been focusing on the corporate bailout angle. Uh, the unemployment insurance uh, expansion here provides an extra $600 a week for four months. $600 a week, that's $2,400 a month, uh, plus whatever unemployment insurance you might be getting already. Um, in most states, it's about $350, $375 a week. Uh, and it also expands the number of the universe of people who qualify for these unemployment benefits. And so people are going to be getting um, $900 plus a week because of this for four months. Do the math there. Uh, that's something like $30,000, uh, depending on your, exactly your family structure, especially if you include then the $1,200 that you're also going to get just for being someone who is a middle class earner. Um, and so there is now there is now an incentive, I think, that is real um, for people who were making uh, who were working minimum wage jobs to ask their bosses to either fire or furlough them and to and to end up taking getting more money from unemployment insurance. And so if you look at um, what the kind of the state of the art in neoliberal policy response for uh, to uh, to the coronavirus is, is to do what a bunch of the countries in Europe, uh, namely the UK and Denmark are doing, which is for government to pay a large percentage of payrolls, provided you keep people on on the payroll, provided you don't fire your workers. The whole idea is this is a time in which we have shut down a lot of work and therefore employers are going to fire a lot of people. What you want is to keep people attached to the labor force, right? We're trying to put the economy in an induced coma. And then you want to be able to bring it out of that coma as quickly as possible. And when it comes out of the coma, you want all the parts that were attached beforehand to be still attached. But if what if this metaphor what, got super yeah, scary. Can we go back yeah, right? to talking so, about so, lung so, congestion? So what the government is doing here with this provision 
is on the one hand, they are providing a big benefit to people who are getting who are losing their jobs as a result of the coronavirus. And I think, again, like I said, I can see a case for at least some of that. But they're also providing an incentive for more people to lose their jobs and they're going to destroy labor market attachments in the process. Uh, there's just a ton of unintended consequences that are going to come out of a rush 2.2, 2.3 trillion dollar package. That's one of them. Uh, the corporate bailout stuff we should also talk about. Other people should should uh, come in there, but there's basically no oversight on it. Um, we remember what happened with the stimulus oversight where CBO released these reports every quarter or so. And they were like, well, we spent X number of dollars. Our models tell us that spending X number of dollars creates X number of jobs. Therefore, we must have created X number of jobs. They did absolutely no on the ground checking as to whether any of those jobs had actually been created. That was left to private uh, to private oversight outside, you know, the Mercatus Center probably did the best work on that sp uh, specific question by actually asking people how they had spent the money. And so there's just going to be a huge number of these unintended consequences of just weird stuff happening, of uh, probably some economic destruction happening as a result of a bill that is designed to keep the economy from falling apart. Can I put a, a happy uh, spin on all of this? Uh, you know, I think the pandemic, uh, both, you know, in its government response from the public health sector, as well as economically in the political realm, this is where the 20th century finally goes to die. Because the, all of this, first off, we have to recognize this in is- In some cases, truly, literally. A truly, you know, yeah, it is. Which it's, it's not, you know, it has to happen, right? I mean, you know, we, we conjured- you know, it, it's not uh, if we're talking mythologically or symbolically, it's not an accident that this is happening in the twilight of the baby boom. This is an attempt to move the 20th century off the stage one way or another. But this is a unanimous bill that both Democrats and Republicans are fully behind more than any other piece of legislation. Probably in the history of the United States, even even, you know, the declaration of war in, uh, you know, in World War Two, there was one House member who voted against it. You know, this is like a completely unanimous bill. And, and Thomas Massey, you know, the libertarian leaning Kentucky Republican has done something spectacular by force trying to force a vote where people were accountable and and the patriots in congress were you know in the house were so brave that they didn't want their names attached to this legislation he got donald trump and john kerry to get all smoochy with each other for making fun of thomas massey this is a truly unanimous bill that shows that the democrats and the republicans ultimately are not different in their approach to government or their solutions to crisis, et cetera. They've been bringing us to this state for the entire 21st century, failing more and more, losing more and more people, doing more and more destruction to the economy. Donald Trump is the last act of the 20th century. This legislation is the last act of the 20th century. And there is going to be hell to pay because there is going to be all kinds of unintended uh, you know, consequences. The intended effects are going to be fucked up beyond belief. I mean, we just double, we, we increased the federal budget, you know, in a, in a week, uh, you know, by 50%. Uh, what, you know, how is that going to play out? This is going to be screwed up for a long time, but I do think this is the thing that ends it all. And now we're going to be looking for serious alternatives to the status quo. And I think there is a libertarian response to this, which is a smaller government that does fewer things well. Um, and then there is the maximalist version, which is coming out of the, Demo you know, the democratic socialist idea. Everything should be universal. The government should either be directly in charge or indirectly in charge of everything. That is the, you know, these are the models going forward. And I, you know, it, you know, it's it's horrible to talk about this, but we need something to stand up and cheer for. And I do think this, you know, if we look at this all and we push forward as libertarians, as well as people like with pre-political or, or po political affiliations, this is the end of the 20th century. And it's shown that what was has been we've been using since the end of World War Two um, doesn't make sense anymore. It does not address the world. It's a map. It's a model. It's a projection or whatever that has lost almost all connection to the territory that it's trying to describe and this so you know coming out of this whether it's in october when those united airline workers you know are free to like start living in the 21st century or something that's when the 21st century will finally begin i Catherine, um i i worry uh just a little bit that it's not over and that we're gonna do a bill like that again 
in a month or six weeks. They're going to try for sure. They're going to yes. have to. They're going to have to. Yeah. Um, and, I just. And I'm, I am always, always, 100, percent always, <gasps> and everywhere a skeptic of the theory that it's going to get bad enough and then everyone becomes a libertarian. It just never does. It it's never get gets bad enough, enough that everyone it's becomes a libertarian. Think about it. it. Like we we see this in the baby steps of, you know, suddenly cities are, are letting people walk around with booze in their hand. Uh, suddenly, you know, the FDA and the CDC are going to eventually have to give up a monopoly on be making bad decisions and let us all make more bad decisions on our own. School choice is breaking out. We're, we're you know, it's it's never easy, but there is a moment where we, we come out of the wreckage and, and are something different. Catherine, uh, Nick mentioned Thomas Massey. So the libertarian moment is 538 bazookas pointed at Thomas Massey. Um, basically. Yeah. Uh, a, but we a, support the right to own those bazookas. So that's, that's the most, most important thing. Uh, what does yeah. it know? What does it tell you that he is the most hated person or was until everyone forgot about it already? But uh, for a, a, a few beautiful hours last week, uh, he was the uniting hate figure of all of American politics. Yeah. I mean, I do. I do think this notion that um, in times of crisis, let's hand wave away all this pesky procedure is a more dangerous one than people give uh, give credit. Uh, and Massey was right to say, hey, if we're going to, you know, if we're going to follow the rules, like I'm allowed to say, let's put this on the record. That's one of my you know, rights and privileges as uh, of my office. And I do think that the notion that this guy is the problem is, you know, is so misbegotten. Like, even if you don't agree with that tactic, right? And you might, you might just be like, hey, you know what? That didn't accomplish a lot. And it was sort of annoying. That would be a fair critique. But it is not fair to say that his underlying point was wrong. His underlying point was absolutely right. That there, you know, the time when you need to follow procedures and follow the rules and read the bill is more in times of crisis. And I think, you know, we should have learned that from the Patriot Act. We should have learned that from the um, authorization of uh, use of force. We should have learned that every time we hastily pass a giant bill in crisis, it lives with us forever and ever. And I think Peter is right. Um, and Matt is right that pretty soon we're going to think about doing this again. And um, I think the story that Nick is telling about um People walking around with cocktails and the FDA letting private companies do their own tests is it's a nice story. But um, mostly, I think uh, a world with more free markets and more choices wins when things are going well, um, when government is basically status quo. And meanwhile, the private sector gets bigger and better and people learn to appreciate it. I don't think crisis yields libertarianism. And I don't think it yields libertarianism, even if we have to go through brokenness first. Um, when we break things, our tendency as a nation, as humans, maybe is to just build the state bigger and stronger and more terrifying after the stuff is broken. I have a question for y'all about the messy thing. Um, does anybody does anybody find any merit to the argument that the problem with Massey's call wasn't sort of the the underlying principle that people should go on the record with their names for voting for this thing. But instead, that what you don't want is to put a whole bunch of old people in a room real close together for a long time in a time of a then why did they virus. not why then why did they not uh, do it by names? So they did it by voice vote, um, yep. which meant that you didn't have to have everybody around in which meant right. that you didn't have to have sort of everybody doing it. No, you, but everybody I, what show I'm up. saying is they did not record the names. But no, no, that's that's my point right. is yeah. is so that the argument against what Massey wanted was a was a record of the names. And the argument against Massey was if you do that, you got to bring everybody uh, in some cases on airplanes back into the building. And to me, this right. just sort of suggests yep. that they what they should have done is had a process in place for say emergency voting online they should have right. which was something that had been talked about after september 11th um where there were like emergency procedures that were discussed but never implemented uh, again a failure of procedure here um a failure to think ahead to plan for this sort of thing uh, but this is but also like all over in the private sector people scrambled and figured out how to do their thing online or how to not do it and instead what congress did be did because it's allowed to do whatever it wants is it both 
didn't do the thing online and then did it anyway. And that's, I think uh, it's fair to say like that was a worst case scenario. And Massey pointing that out, uh, I think, I think was fair. Even if in the end you say, you know what, we're not gonna, we're not gonna put, you know, our geriatric uh, representatives on a bunch of airplanes and bring them back in. It's incumbent upon Massey's colleagues to convince him of that. It's not just uh, wave it away and, you know, go on talk shows and talk smack about him. Well, and eventually also, they didn't need to convince him. They just sort of decided to ignore him. Right. Which they didn't even do that. Right. Like like the correct thing to do would have been to in the world's most collegial deliberative body, whatever we call it, um, to to convince each other and talk. They have Skype. <laughs> they have Zoom, even if they can't vote that way. Yeah, but they uh, don't know and, how to use it. And it's uh, Massey pointed out in one of his uh, uh, tweet storms about this that. It was Nancy Pelosi who delayed the vote for many, right, many, many week. days beforehand yeah. uh, to try to to tailor Sweet it to, according to her own needs. And so that's crucial time that could have been spent doing something else. I would also just point out in agreement with Catherine that today, I believe the uh, Hungarian uh, parliament uh, has basically given um, uh, Viktor Orban uh, uh, authoritarian powers over the country, like canceling elections. You can go to jail for five years for fake news uh, having to do with the coronavirus. It's the, sort of the emergency procedures we're going to wipe away. He can uh, issue laws by decree instead of passing them by the legislature. Um, it's a, a country that I used to live in uh, and, and cover and have a great uh, deal of fondness for. And it's um, also a place that a lot of uh, kind of paleo conservatives and then Trumpian conservatives, and it, uh, have held up as a as an example of a of a uh, particularly good leader. Um, it's a it's a, a very sad day, and it's a cautionary tale uh, for what uh, bad governments will do in this crisis, and sure. we should take uh, take care not to make the same mistake. And one thing that I've noticed that it's uh, that's been distressing among the many other things that are distressing. Is people, media in particular, have been fixating on various things. Um, uh, you know, there's a big mallet over here, and Donald Trump isn't using the mallet. I'm thinking in, uh, specifically about the Defense Production Act. Um, uh, like, why isn't the president? What what kind of monster is he for not using this law to conscript um, private companies to build stuff, which will inevitably be bad, probably, uh, the conscription and the building and, and everything associated with it. But uh, this kind of trying to um, shame the president who you hate for not taking maximum power in this time is just a very weird move. And we should all be conscious of uh, the authoritarian um, moves by everybody in this moment and to sort of build in safeguards that begin between the ears uh, before we go yeah. uh, forward. Well, and doubly let me, let weird to insist point. on that at a time when every single private entity that can possibly reorient itself toward whatever efficient solution to this problem it feels like it can contribute to is doing that. I mean, it, to the extent that any firm anywhere is not didn't have a meeting among their top executives and say, what can we be doing to help with this problem? What can we be doing to provide that can like the people something people want to buy something that people need? Like, I, I guarantee you, like, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of companies around this country ask themselves that question. The idea that Donald Trump with his giant mallet can hit all of these CEOs on the head and say, okay, now do the do something that's going to solve this problem and that that will be better than what's already occurred. I think it's so misbegotten. And if people aren't acting right now, it's for a good reason. And sometimes that reason is a regulatory barrier. So maybe let's look at those. But to sort of demand production, particularly from factories or companies where the government happens to have more leverage um, when, in fact, the most useful production might come from somewhere else entirely is exactly wrong. Well, uh, and part know. of this is that things like masks, just to focus on that specifically, are regulated as medical devices. And therefore, there are limits on how many masks per day can be sterilized or produced. Uh, the FDA has to approve all of this stuff. Um, and instead of asking for the president to sort of step up and take more power, what we should be doing is saying, hey, you should be releasing, you should be ending or, you know, or at least suspending temporarily these regulations, probably putting them up for serious review for after the fact um, and saying, look, uh, private companies that are ready and capable uh, uh, to to solve all of these problems, let them do it. 
and there are there are I mean, we we just we know um, the f for example, Battelle says that they could process uh, eight, something like 80,000 masks a day. And there are there's a limit um, put in place by the FDA of 10,000. Why is that limit there? I have no idea. Perhaps there was uh, some sort of coherent reason at some point in history that somebody could supply. There is not one right now. And the FDA in particular is uh, will come in for a harsh reckoning because they're making a lot of dictatorial yeah. decisions that are completely un unexplained. Maybe they have a good reason, but they're not giving them. Matt, I want to go back to the, this, the, you know, this one question, though, of like, when do we when do we gain in freedom? Um, and, you know, there's no question first. And, and I'm not um, not trying to put you on the spot, but no, nobody's expecting the libertarian moment to to you know, rise out of Hungary, <clears throat> you know, not since the Middle Ages, right, uh, probably or something. Uh, but when in in the Declaration of Independence, we talked about how the 70s was a moment where simultaneously you had the most grotesque kind of uh, beef up of government at the end of the great society under LBJ and then under under Nixon, wage and price controls, all sorts of things happening where the government was flexing like it hadn't since World War II, really, since a wartime economy. And exactly at that moment, all kinds of stuff started to get more free because people were like, fuck it. We're not we don't believe the government. The government is is exercising more and more control over more and more parts of our lives. And we are going to go elsewhere and we're, we're going to do it, you know, in in economic terms and in terms of business development and innovation, as well as lifestyle and things like that. And this is where I do think there is an analogy. I mean, I'm not just going to carp on this until either I die or, or it turns out to be right. But there is a moment. No, but there, you know, there there is a moment where people people have have lost, lost confidence and trust, have lost confidence and trust in the government and many aspects of private, uh, you know, of, of private life in the private sector, nonprofit sector, uh, you know, I, and and w we will continue to do stuff for ourselves. And I think this is the moment like where we have to recognize there is a beginning to a consensus in American politics, uh, you know, for different periods, and there is an end to them. And this is the moment where we need to be wallpapering the world with alternative ideas that have not gotten as full a hearing as they need to, because we are at the end of this. All of the great institutions, you know, both cultural and economic, political, you know, you name it, of the post-war era, including the post-Cold War era, they have been, you know, they've been shown not to be up to the task. And it's a question for us, how do we map a world and how do we, how do we kind of cajole people into saying, why not give this a shot? I think this is, this is the beginning of that moment. And it's going to be a lot uglier before we get more breathing space, literally and figuratively. Uh, just uh, very briefly, I would uh, would say that uh, we would need in that in that example, or let's say I'm rooting for it in that example, there to be a uh, someone showing that that approach worked in this crisis or in this context as a country or a city state or something like that. Um, there needs to be uh, an example. And right now, as I look around the world, it's one of the reasons I'm more pessimistic than I was in 2008, is that the context of 2020, uh, 2020, um, uh, and I'm not talking about the Beach Boys record for once, um, is uh, worse than the context for 2008. There's a, it's the the competition for policy, uh, the laboratories of whatever are uh, are in kind of uh, trending <clears throat> in a bad direction. Um, I, you know, certainly in terms of economic controls, in terms of public health, I think when you look at countries like Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, Germany, uh, these are countries that all have strong authoritarian tendencies or abilities and whatnot. The way that they have acted is having a public health kind of uh, administration or regimen regime. Uh, that actually came in and made a few quick decisions early that then allowed for a normalization that's already starting to take place. And I think that's on one level. And I think we'll see, you know, the, the question here is coming out, is, is China is China the model of the future? Uh, you know, probably not, both in terms of economics and, and in terms of public health. And I think that's going to become more clear as we gain more information about their response. Like, you know, that is the epicenter of all of this. And it's, you know, authoritarian regimes do, do not do well in public health crises over the long run.
And yeah, as part of that, a lot of uh, areas of the world which have yet to really uh, see a large number of reported tests um, are going to see them um, uh, later, and then that'll change the way that we look at all of this. All right, let's go to our end of podcast. Just before we move on completely, oh, I do want to add one uh, one notable fact about China is that they have been claiming, oh, look, we're getting better. Uh, our response has, you know, we uh, are locking everything down worked. And what did they do last week after starting to reopen a bunch of their businesses and things like movie theaters? They closed down a bunch of their movie theaters again. And now they're saying that it's not really, it has nothing to do with this. Our numbers are still getting better, but it really- It's clo- just the it, movies it, are no right. good. No, but in, fa- yeah. but in fact, like what that shows is like, don't listen to what they say, watch what they do. And they are worried about reinfection. They don't think that they have actually stopped this thing. And also watch what they do is the kicking out journalists to make sure yeah. that no one can watch what yeah. they do. All right. End of podcast. What have you been consuming during the quarantine era? Catherine, I will start with you. I'm continuing my Jane Austen reading festival. Wow. I know it's ridiculous, but I have to say, like I finished uh, Mansfield Park and in particular, the scenes of the amateur theatricals that they are putting on at home, which... Uh, end up being a sort of uh, moral contagion to the neighborhood. So good. So on point. Um, I have moved on to Emma, which is uh, a little bit lighter and perhaps more relevant for the uh, carening of our society, the people sort of monitoring each other's behavior. Um, and uh, and it's good. And honestly, guys, like, I I know everyone's like, that's ridiculous, but you're wrong, and uh, everyone should read Jane Austen continuing their way through her great works as the pandemic progresses. Uh, speaking of Jane Austen, uh, Nick, you uh, listened to a song that was as long as a Jane Austen novel, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it is uh, Bob Dylan's longest recorded song, uh, Murder Most Foul, which was recorded sometime in the past decade. It's not exactly clear when. And uh uh, that he dropped towards the end of last week. And it starts out uh, talking about that dread day in uh, November of 1963, uh, or the Kennedy assassination. And then it ends being this kind of, you know, brilliantly Dylan-esque uh, rumination about all sorts of um, of things that have happened, historical events, songs, individuals, movements, and things like that. Um, it's uh, to me, uh, you know, one of the things that is great about Dylan is that he is, I think, the the ultimate American artist of the post-war era of the past 70 years. And he is dying. He's, you know, 800 years old and hit the world that he has been chronicling. He hasn't released a new album in, in uh, an album of new material in years. He's been going through the American songbook. He is kind of creating this wonderful um network of connections and meaning where everything is connected to everything. And it's, you know, and I, I read this piece as like, it is a nice uh, send off again to a kind of baby boom America, which is the last emanation of that post-war consensus. Uh, I highly recommend Murder Most Foul and like all great art now, it's available for free on YouTube. There are already a million commentaries, uh, most of which are kind of uninteresting, but you know, it's uh, to each his own. Uh, and then when you get bored with that, watch Tiger King on Netflix. Uh, I, uh, I listened to the song. I think I had a pretty similar reaction to uh, Jesse Walker, one of our three or four Dylanologists on staff, which is that you start at the first and go like, are you, I, am I really going to listen to a 17 minute song about the JFK assassination? Oh, and then it's like, why is it so short? Uh, why is it so short? And he's just sort of noodling on his piano. And yeah, and it's wonderful. Talk- and then by the end, uh, you get a little choked up as he's kind of name name calling half of American culture and including some uh, uh, there's a, a nice little obscure Warren Zevon reference, which uh, right. made me maybe I'll uh, choke up. I want to go next because um, I think that Catherine probably has recommended this before. Um, and it's a quarantine thing that I watch with the kids, the homeschooling um, and also I have a question. That's why I wanted to bring this up. So it's our planet. The uh, the the, uh, the incredible yeah. nature slash global warming documentary with nature, s- sir. Nature is a human construct. No, Matt. this this the the context in which I have mentioned this in the past is that that's my kind of nature, the kind of nature that David Attenborough is telling me about uh, on my TV screen. It is it is, it is totally propaganda. Um, uh, and it is 
gorgeous. I recommend for it's any uh, of the listeners out there um, or whatever. Uh, I just suppressed a very good joke. Um, uh, and uh, you'll thank me later. Was um, it suppression or mitigation? Suppression. Um, anybody who likes to just smoke a bowl and trip out on a nice, big, beautiful thing. Don't listen to the words as much as just sort of see this incredible visual. It's, I mean, just like ice shelves in slow motion falling down and, and, and orcas <laughs> playing with, with penguins trading them yeah. back and forth for fun. And, and, uh, this very horrible, oh like wall was death. Um, Anyways, it's total agitprop of like global warming is killing everybody and whatever. Um, take that for what it is. But I, I, it's been a while since I've like tucked into some nature documentaries, and I got a question. And maybe this is going to sound naive. They're bullshit, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. They tell they're the all stories, shot. They, they're they shot like, on the same soundstage that the Apollo Eleven landed <laughs> Thank was you. faked it's on. They're, right? they're I mean, written Peter, by the same guys who write yeah. professional wrestling. I mean, Peter like probably follow, has like a it's whole like Vanderpump rules. They yeah. follow a baby chick through, yeah. you know, an entire lifespan. You didn't have a camera there the whole time. They're, it's exactly the same as reality TV, right? So they capture yeah. 50,000 yeah. hours of footage and then they cobble together a story, which does not reflect like a real thing that happened in real time, but it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter even more than it doesn't matter in reality TV because like the baby chicks, not a, person like it's not it's like there's no reputation to like ruin or live with it's but what just... about what about the, the wow sound? you really hate animals don't you it yeah. totally does what about the sound because I, th I think the sound editing also might... oh you think it's like someone with a pair of shoes like oh i i think it's mickey rooney of... in a studio using his waddle it's, wow uh, yeah, it's all I, made up man it's, it's all uh, it's all man-made thank god i'm not smoking the aforementioned bowls of whatever um i like it, it that it was family movie night and also matt's just like yeah, so Absolutely were you totally blade. high, Matt? Are you like, uh, are you that's like, a, uh, that's Murray not a bad Wilson? way to parent. Are you drinking yo. cocktails. And... I'm a, I'm a quitter. I, I, I can't, I can't, uh, I don't, uh, like Ringo Starr, I don't smoke it no more. Uh, Peter, what have you wow. been consuming besides Guys, everything on the shelf behind you? <laughs> uh, and, well, you can see most of those bottles are, are full, um, for now. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah. I replace most, them every yeah. couple well, of days. Well, it's what, it's like 12 o'clock in the morning here, right? Or 12 noon, Peter. I'm drinking coffee. Okay. Um, uh, no, I've been watching Killing Eve, the first season of Killing Eve, on, which is a BBC show uh, produced and written, co-produced and co-written uh, by none other than Catherine's Fleabag fave, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. It is a post-Cold War spy thriller about a, yeah, do the dance. This is this is dance-worthy. Um, I dare it is, dance it for Phoebe. It's a, it's a contemporary spy thriller about a sort of secret Russia desk in MI6 um, in which uh, a... Uh, an agent played by Sandra O oh, um, is tracking a uh, a mercenary who is a, a, a female killer. Um, it's a kind of, you know, a, like a reductive way to describe it would be as a feminist twist on the Jean Le Carré uh, spy thriller. But it's so, so much better than even that. And I would like that sort of thing, to be clear. But it's so much better than that. It's just humane and witty and and like surprisingly light and deft and funny at times while also managing to capture some of the real horror of being uh tr of tracking uh somebody who is a completely emotionless murderer perhaps like Catherine um and uh and it's just it's so well done it's so enjoyable and it is a break from our world with the exception of the fact that you see all these people walking around London and other cities and they're all just like walking around and having a normal one except with the uh, you know all the like all the the spy shit Except aside right I, the murder. I, but like they're just walking around and they go to restaurants and they have coffee meetings with each other and you're like oh that's what the world is supposed to be like and i i kind of yeah it makes me like a little bit sad but also it's really well written and, and engaging and i highly recommend it to just anybody who has ever liked a spy thriller i'm just bummed that a thing called killing eve wasn't written by bill o'reilly um, I think that's his next uh, thing. Very good. Very good. Afterwards. All right. Uh, that's all uh, the time that we have here for our first ever attempted video thing. Hopefully it'll be released uh, on video. We'll see. Um, uh, it's an experiment. Uh, and uh, keep listening to all our podcasts. Reason.com podcast. 
the Wednesday interview, uh, the Reason interview on Wednesday with uh, Nick Gillespie. Yep. And uh, so Hope Forum might, might see some backlogs. <laughs> uh, it's going to be, uh, <laughs> we're going to be going into deep cuts on, yeah, uh, yeah classics on the Soho Forum. And, with a K. Uh, yeah. B-sides. Just have those uh, like same super nope. cuts from VH1 of like uh, you know oh, John yeah, Fugel yeah. saying talking about it. Yeah, and introducing Hall of Oats. Crazy. <laughs> um, okay, uh, goodbye everyone, and we'll see you next week.